The Director's Cut, an inescapable term for any fan of cinema or anyone on social media, really. Director's cuts are certainly an enigma in Hollywood. Sometimes they can improve a movie drastically, sometimes they make a bad movie even worse, and sometimes they even make a good movie bad. In this video, we will take a look at 25 director's cuts and how they completely changed the theatrical version of the movie, whether it be for the good, the bad, or the downright ugly. Let's dive in. Of course, how can we not start with Zack Snyder's Justice League cut? After Snyder left the Justice League partway through filming, the studio brought in Joss Whedon as his replacement. Uh, this gave the studio an opportunity to cut away all the things they didn't like about Snyder's vision and add in new scenes that, in their minds, would appeal to the general masses. You know the whole story. Many fans, however, complained about how Snyder's vision was ruined and wanted to see what he had in store for the film. Rumors of a Snyder Cut started spelling out online before they eventually became a reality, with the Snyder version finally being released this year. The biggest change, of course, is the runtime, with it clocking in at over four hours, but also characters such as Cyborg and The Flash are more fleshed out. There are added character motivations, more flashbacks and action scenes, new characters, a nightmarish epilogue, and of course, slow-mo. But Justice League isn't the only Snyder movie to get its own director's cut. In terms of wholesale changes, Snyder's ultimate edition of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice doesn't make any drastic changes or ultimately change the story. But it does add an extra 30 minutes of content that does fix some of the movie's plot holes and makes for a more coherent film. For example, it takes a deeper dive into Lex Luthor's plan to frame Superman for murder in Africa and gives the audience a little more understanding of Luthor's motivations. And of course, it gives us some more Batman versus Superman. Still, there is another comic book movie that Snyder gave his own cut of, Watchmen. While the theatrical cut is still a pretty faithful adaptation of the graphic novel, there is a director's cut that is even more faithful, with it being even longer and more fleshed out, with more scenes from the graphic novel added. Still though, I'm waiting for the actual faithful adaptation, the Squid Monster cut. For Superman 2, original director Richard Donner had grandiose plans for the movie, but he was eventually fired as he was well over budget. He was replaced by Richard Lester, but this caused a number of behind-the-scenes issues with actors Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman refusing to return for reshoots. Brando was ultimately cut out of the theatrical cut completely, but when production began on the 2006 Superman Returns movie, the team searched for some of the unused Brando footage. This led to the Donner cut taking place, which used only 20% of Lester's footage, brought Brando back into the movie, gave further explanations on plot points, and gave the movie an overall darker tone. Although Donner never got to film all of the scenes he wanted and had to rely on the use of test footage to fill in the gaps. Zack Snyder certainly supported fans' calls for his cut of Justice League to be released, but one director who has told fans not to campaign for their release is Josh Trank. Trank directed the 2015 critical and commercial bomb Fantastic Four, but due to disagreements and conflicting visions with the studio, as well as extensive reshoots, production turned into a bit of a mess. After the movie was released, Trank alluded that he had a better idea and version of the movie in mind that would have gotten excellent reviews. However, if this is true or not will forever remain a mystery. When it comes to X-Men movies, Days of Future Past is often regarded as one of the strongest and most loved, but it had one thing missing, Rogue. In the original Vision, Rogue had a much more integral story arc in the movie, but this was almost completely cut out. However, in 2015, the studio gave us the Rogue cut, which adds an extra 17 minutes to the movie and fully restores Rogue's original storyline, which includes her taking over from Kitty to keep Logan's consciousness in the past. And many see the Rogue cut as the definitive version of the movie. In 2005, Frank Miller brought his comic book Sin City to life alongside Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. The movie is extremely faithful to the comic book, however, director Robert Rodriguez released an alternate cut with an added 10 scenes that were taken straight from the graphic novel. However, they don't add much to the movie and actually break up the narrative flow. For example, instead of beginning and ending with Hardigan's story, as they do in the theatrical cut, they cram the culmination of all the different storylines into one long segment, removing that circular flow of the original version. I know it's subjective, but hey, 
I'm sticking by it. There is little you can do to make an epic series such as The Lord of the Rings even better, but director Peter Jackson found a way when he released his extended trilogy. The theatrical cut of the trilogy isn't exactly what you would call short, but Jackson added an extra 128 minutes of content to the series, which culminated in a collective runtime of 11 hours and 26 minutes. Added scenes include Saruman's death in Isengard, Gondal fighting the Witch King, Theodred's funeral, and Aragorn's real age. The theatrical cut is certainly brilliant, but the extended version is even better. But a director meddling in a beloved franchise doesn't always have a positive effect. Just ask George Lucas. Since the original Star Wars trilogy was released, the franchise has become notorious for going back and making alterations like Hayden Christensen in Return of the Jedi. Back in 1997, George Lucas announced he would be re-releasing his original trilogy into theaters with a few changes. For the most part, the changes were minor. A little CGI added, some digital touch-ups, a few added blast of sound effects, some more Chewbacca growls, nothing major. But there was one big change, the Greedo scene. In the original version, Han shoots Greedo under the table preemptively, but this was changed in the 1997 version to have Greedo shooting first and missing, with Han later shooting and killing Greedo. Due to backlash, this was again changed in 2004 to the two shooting simultaneously, which, uh, sure. It's safe to say E.T. fans see anyone who alters or tampers with the movie near blasphemous even if it's the movie's director, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg released a director's cut of the film where all of the guns used by the government were digitally replaced with walkie-talkies. Seeing as this is a movie aimed at children, you can understand the reasoning, but it didn't really work. Only little kids can see him. Give me a break. Spielberg also updated E.T. by giving him added digital facial expressions, which in no way made him look worse. That, that was sarcasm, by the way. Uh, Spielberg did at least acknowledge, though, that the cut was a mistake. Speaking of Spielberg, when he wanted to make a director's cut for his Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the studio wanted the inside of the UFO mothership to be seen for marketing purposes. Spielberg reluctantly agreed, and a scene with Roy entering the UFO mothership was added at the very end. Spielberg was unsatisfied with this cut due to the ending, and re-re-released the movie again as a definitive director's cut in 1998, which melded together the director's favorite parts of both the 1977 and 1980 versions, removing the UFO mothership scene once and for all. Now, we really couldn't talk about director's cuts and not mention Ridley Scott's sci-fi classic, Blade Runner. The original theatrical cut ended with Deckard and Rachel having a happy ending driving off into the sunset together, as well as having an infamous voiceover narration which Harrison Ford hated so much, it's literally the definition of monotone. Ironically though, the director's cut, which was released 10 years later in 1992, wasn't actually under the control of Ridley Scott, but it is admittedly closer to his original vision with the voiceover thankfully gone, the happy ending stripped away, and unicorn dream sequences added that make us question, is Deckard himself actually a replicant? Scott did get to finally release his version of the film in the final cut, where he remastered the visuals, improved the audio, added in new elements to the score, and added even more unicorn dream sequences, and it is generally regarded as THE definitive version of Blade Runner. After the success of Gladiator, Ridley Scott worked on another historical epic, Kingdom of Heaven. However, the studio was concerned as to whether or not it would be suitable for the masses and forced Scott to cut 50 minutes of the content from the movie cutting down its 194-minute runtime to 144 minutes. Scott did get to release his version of the movie a year later, which featured more bloody battles, as well as a number of different character subplots and overall characterization. While it perhaps doesn't make for a significantly better movie, it is at least arguably a stronger one. The sci-fi sequel Aliens is another example of a movie where the studio pressured the director to cut down the runtime and increase the action, and James Cameron was forced to shave off 17 minutes worth of content. Cameron's special edition of the movie was later released, however, with it adding more characters and story depth along with new action set pieces. An example of a scene cut from the original movie is the moment Ripley learns that her daughter has died, which goes on to set up her relationship with Newt. The Aliens director's cut may not have made groundbreaking alterations to the movie, but the Alien 3 assembly cut certainly did. 
Released in 1993, the assembly cut not only added 37 minutes of new content, but rearranged a number of the existing sequences and replaced them with new scenes. Despite the fact that director David Fincher didn't actually work on the assembly cut, he did at least give his blessing and it does perhaps feel more like what the director originally had in mind. Despite not being the most accessible of movies, Donnie Darko went on to be a surprise cult hit. On the back of the movie's success, director Richard Kelly went on to make his own director's version, using a number of deleted scenes to beef up the 113-minute runtime to 134 minutes. The deleted scenes went on to reveal and explain a number of the movie's mysteries and biggest questions. But one of the strongest elements of Donnie Darko was the fact that it was so enigmatic and, while the director's cut definitely didn't spoil the original movie, it did take away some of the mystery that made it so beloved in the first place. In terms of runtime, the I Am Legend director's cut doesn't make much of a difference with it only adding three minutes onto the theatrical version's 96 minute runtime, but there are still some big differences. In the theatrical version, Will Smith's Dr. Neville discovers a cure for the virus that turns people into monsters, but then sacrifices himself at the end to take out the Darkseers in order for his fellow survivors to escape. This is very different in the alternate ending, with Dr. Neville revealed to not be the hero, but the movie's villain. The lead male of the Darkseers communicates with Neville and tells him that the Darkseer he is holding captive is actually his partner. Like, like in a romantic way, not in like a, like a 48 hours kind of way. The Darkseers also have established their own society and see Neville as the boogeyman as he kidnaps members of their society away for testing, completely different to the theatrical version. Mike Flanagan's Dr. Sleep may not have had the same cinematic effect as Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, but it did a good job of paying tribute to both Kubrick's movie and the works of author Stephen King. Flanagan's director's cut, however, provides even more tributes to the books, with the movie being broken down into chapters, having a slower pacing, more character development, and of course a longer runtime of 182 minutes compared to the 150-minute theatrical version. Like a few on this list, Luc Besson's extended version of Leon the Professional is essentially a longer, more fleshed-out version of the original movie, but it is arguably more troublesome. As Matilda goes through more training, she becomes more complicit in a number of hits and becomes a direct accomplice on a number of kills. But the most troubling aspect is Leon and Matilda's relationship, which is much more uh, questionable in the extended version. Along with being notorious for how much of a nightmare it was to shoot, Apocalypse Now is known for its number of different versions. After the original movie was released in 1979, a Redux version came out in 2001, which was almost 50 minutes longer, added more characterization to Brando's Kurtz, changed the pace and tempo of the movie, and rearranged certain scenes. This seemed like the final version of the movie, but Coppola released his director's cut in 2019 with the main element being the remastered visuals. But it was again a different beast, with it being a slightly more streamlined version of the Redux, with the pace and the tone all being changed once again. In terms of changing the plot, Judd Apatow's unrated version of 40-Year-Old Virgin doesn't change much, but it does add a number of new scenes filled with vulgar humor and tons of other more adult scenes. Mostly, though, the unrated cut adds more dialogue and extends certain scenes, which, if you are a fan of the original movie, will certainly be entertaining, but doesn't necessarily add much in terms of story. Team America World Police is already pushing it when it comes to vulgar humor and scenes where you question what exactly you're watching. Because of how crazy it is, it is actually kind of surprising that a lot of things were actually censored out. But for anyone who may see the movie as tame, Matt Stone and Trey Parker released an uncensored and unrated version of the movie, which is more in keeping with their original vision, and also features this really crazy puppet sex scene that we can't show you, which they specifically just made to mess with the MPAA. <laughs> which, you go, guys. Dumb and Dumber is another highly celebrated and beloved comedy, and actually thrives because the characters are so naive and lovable. But there is an unrated version of the movie which is much cruder and arguably much creepier, basically cutting out the charm of Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels and making them more uncomfortable. It might be better for some, but uh, nah, nah, not for me. Despite being seen as one of the most influential movies of all time, Metropolis has a number of different versions as the original theatrical cut was actually lost. 
This caused many film buffs to seek out and restore the classic movie. Infamously, musician Giorgio Moroder outbid David Bowie for the rights to the movie and sought to restore it with a new and eventually very much hated soundtrack for the movie and with a cut down runtime of 83 minutes. In 2001, an authorized version of the movie was made after new material was found, but after a negative was discovered in Buenos Aires, even more content was added. This came in at 148 minutes, over 30 minutes longer than the original under the title The Complete Metropolis, which by the way is available in a very nice edition from Kino Lorber. A Touch of Evil is another prime example of director versus studio, with director Orson Welles battling with Universal over the movie. Universal wanted a much more conventional, spoon-fed storyline and employed director Harry Keller to follow their wishes. Welles, not being pleased with this, wrote a 58-page memo in response where he heavily detailed his vision for the movie. His version would finally come to light in 1998 when editor Walter Murch cut the movie to Welles' expressed vision and, despite the director's cut, only being three minutes longer, it is a bigger, bolder, and in my opinion, better version of the studio movie. Let's end on one last one, shall we? Takashi Miike is one of the most prolific filmmakers of all time, and will probably make another movie before I finish this sentence. So it's no surprise there is a theatrical cut of his gory masterpiece, 13 Assassins. The cut is 16 minutes longer and is even more brutal and action-packed, and even hints at the supernatural. Ooh. 